Um, I'm Leanne Darrington, for those of you who I don't know, or you don't know me, I'm the CEO of the WA Primary Health Alliance. Um, just uh, by way of introduction, today is a conversation. Uh, it's not an industry briefing per se. Uh, and for those of you who are saying, what's the difference between an industry briefing and a conversation? An industry briefing will be to talk with you quite formally about when we're going to market, or in other words, putting out expressions of interest tenders and so forth, and we will engage you in very particular conversations then, but we can talk about that as we go forward. Um, the other point of interest is that this is both a mental health and an alcohol and other drug conversation, and I realise we've omitted to leave put alcohol and other drug on that particular slide. And I appreciate for some of you that you would see those as very separate topics. And some of them, some of you will see them as topics that interface uh, on occasion. And we're trying to find a way that recognises that, that the, there are occasions where there is an interface for the person who requires a service, for some and for others not so. Danny's going to do the presentation today and talk you through where we're at, and what we're thinking, and the model as it is developing. Uh, and. You might have some thoughts about that and we'll encourage you to use, not only have conversations with us individually, but also use Primary uh, Care Exchange, which is our medium for having conversations. So I just say that because it's really hard to bring people together all the time, but these are ways of having conversations and we'll talk more about that as we go forward. We're also going to encourage people with a lived experience, consumers of services to also set up conversations so that there is a community of interest for different people in our, you know, who have different interests in our uh, network to have conversations. So keep that card promoted as well. Um, so there's just probably three points I'm going to say to you before, which are virtually scene setters, and it won't matter whether we're talking really about people with a chronic disease or a co-occurring chronic disease and a mental health issue. Uh, or people who live in urban parts of Perth versus remote communities. But there are three things that I want you just to take away as thoughts about why it is that primary health networks exist and what it is that we're charged with doing. Um, it is fair to say though that the brief of the primary health networks is evolving as the Commonwealth policies around <coughs> primary health also evolve. So we don't see this as a static environment, but one that is emerging and evolving, and, and hence you'll see evolving change as we go forward. So I say that to my dear Commonwealth colleagues in the room, that uh, we are seeing both commitments made by the Commonwealth that will take us down certain paths, uh, but also the policy framework for those commitments that will start to evolve as we go forward. So why do we exist? Uh, here are the three sort of top lines for you. The first one is that we exist to improve access to clinical treatment and services for people. And these may be people for whom their access to care is limited and or difficult, uh, or not indeed the services aren't available. It's for people who largely are residing in more disadvantaged communities where access is therefore also limited and therefore often have poor health status compared to people in other communities. So if we compare our data about the health of people who live on the coastal strip of parts of Perth to uh, let's say the hills or indeed further, going further east, you'll see the health status of communities change and it's not trite when I say that people's health status relates to postcode. Any of you know that social determinants are a critical factor in people's health and wellbeing, and we can't ignore that fact either, even though we can't mitigate for a range of the social determinants. But knowing what I've just said to you means that we have a very much a place-based focus rather than a program focus. I think one of the opportunities the Commonwealth have provided the PHNs 
is the opportunity to do regional and local commissioning. And commissioning means working with both citizens and the community, but providers as well, in localities to knit together the services in a way that works for the residents and citizens of that community. And in our mind, we use the word hotspot, like it's a bit of jargon, but for us what that means is that there is people with poor health status that have had poor health status for a long time, so it's not just this year, and that it converges with a range of issues concurrently. And it often is the convergence of chronic diseases, alcohol and other drugs, and mental health. It's not saying it's always that, but we often know that that is the converging, prevailing set of health status issues for a community. And many of you, like Fiona Stanley did, as I say at 3 a.m. this morning, because of a three hour time difference with the ESCAP, talked about the issue of alcohol and other drugs and suicide and so forth, starting in early childhood where young people are growing up. Anyway, so we have a focus on improving access to treatment services, primary care <coughs> treatment services. Um, we have a focus on the population group who have prevailing health concerns over time and who reside in communities where access is poor. We have a focus on outcomes. And some of you might have seen that we recently put out an innovation trial in um, Perth around starting to join up social and primary care to start to see if there are opportunities to systematise access into primary care with those providers who are working with people today who know they have health concerns but can't get the health addressed that they think might be warranted. Um, we're focused on the whole person, so for us that notion of the co-occurring nature of issues is important. We're focused on a place and then we're focused on a wider system. So rather than focused on a program, we take a one person in a place, one system. Finally, the only other takeaway, and many of you will have been a party to this through the Mental Health and Alcohol and Other Drug Atlas. Um, we're very much focused on data and evidence. So the data is where is the prevalence of illness and so forth, but also what is the current supply. So what's available, how is it delivered, what does it look like, in mental health and alcohol and other drug we've been doing through the Atlas project. And those of you who haven't had a say in that and been involved, please let us know and we'll point you in the right direction. But that's a statewide activity. Um, we're very much um, focused on evidence-based interventions, and but they have to be localised to make sense to the service users, as I've described. And we're very interested in looking, looking to only measure outcomes for people who use services, both their own experience of the outcome, but the wider outcome, rather than count process throughput activities. So an outcomes focus in measurement, but using the data and so forth. Finally, I think just as a takeaway, <coughs> you only have to read the paper once a week to know that we've got a very expensive health system and that's because there's a view that we've got a lot more people using the tertiary end of the system who could receive services back in primary health and, and actually get a much better outcome. So not to get sicker over time or in fact not to use the emergency department. And one of our roles is to try to rebalance the system somewhat that people do get that access earlier and don't move up into the sort of tertiary end of care too quickly. So I'm not, this is not a test, so I'm not going to ask you to repeat back <laughs> while we exist. But uh, there's some take homes in there for you that we see that the issues of mental health and AOD can coexist, and that's important for us to recognise. And how that manifests in a community is also important to recognise if we are to start to make changes. So we've got plenty of time for questions at the end of the session, or <coughs> at least. For those of you that don't know, uh, Linda, who's just standing there waiting to sit down, Linda's the general manager of the country, WAPHN. Uh, so any of you from the country environment who want to have a chat, there she is. And Bernie, who's here, um, is the general manager for Perth, Perth North and Perth South, so Perth. And both of them will talk to you later. And now I'll introduce Danny, who's our general manager of mental health and alcohol and other drugs. <coughs> and he supports the staff across the organisation with the sort of strategy frameworks and so forth. Over to you.
Um, I'm the general manager of mental health, which also covers AOD and suicide prevention. And <coughs> we tend to in-house call it the whole lot mental health. It's just convenient. We don't need to be some wants on job titles for people. And so when we're talking about mental health in general, we're talking about AOD and suicide prevention. And it's not confined to people whose primary condition is a mental health disorder. It can be, it's people broadly in the community who have mental health problems. It may be secondary to another condition. And to reiterate and go through some of the uh, background that Leanne has just presented. So, what's the vision of WAFA is to provide improved health equity in Western Australia, and that's critically important. If you look across the distribution of morbidity <coughs> and across the state, there are many fold differences. It's not a difference in order of one or two fold. Sometimes you can have five or eight fold differences in the provision and access to care. And that's because of part of the way that care is structurally organised in, in the state and partly to do with the remoteness, but not exclusively. It's also to do with the, the evolved mode of delivery. And the services that are built off the back of secondary care tend to be located in buildings. That's the way that services are structured. And therefore, when you, when you build off the back of that, you, you, you tend to amplify rather than ameliorate difference. And it's critically important for us that we're not building our service off the bottom or the back of secondary care. But we're starting off and building a primary care mental health system from the bottom up. And if, when you build from the bottom up, if that exposes gaps between the second primary and secondary system, so be it, we should recognise and respond to those. Whereas if we build off the bottom of secondary care, we're just gap building and working down. So our approach is that the right care, the right place, and the right time. The timeliness is critically important. Access to care and, and delay in access to care is also enormously varying across the state. You know, the waiting lists in one area and that other are considerable. What do primary health networks do? <coughs> we provide leadership around the integration of the uh, primary care sector, including the commissioning of services. Um, operate within discrete communities, including geographic communities work closely in partnership with local health districts, key providers and communities. <coughs> and we use a systems approach. And I'll talk, I'll talk a deal about that systems approach, particularly approaching barriers to care. There are barriers to care throughout our system. And we need to address those in a systematic way. So what was the goal of this piece of work that I started in WAFA in April? and this is the piece of work that's been occupying my time since then. It was developed a mental health framework that includes AOD and suicide prevention that aligns with Commonwealth objectives and guidelines and guidance. We have a, a number of guidance documents provided by the Commonwealth who set the system conditions in which we have to design care. The, the WAFA way, the way WAFA is, is organized to provide care more broadly. And I'll talk a little bit about that. And evidence about what works. And critical to that is what works in comparable real world settings. You know, I have a one parallel background in research and everything we do in a research centre works. You know, it, it just doesn't work when you try and do it in the Ithara. Um, it's the nature of research. You, you take, there tends to be a bias towards you know, working in settings where you can control all the extraneous variables. It just doesn't work when you do it in the real world. And Shifting an approach from program-based to place-based outcomes, and that, that's crucial. And that's, whilst it's not, they say there's a policy position in the Commonwealth, there's a, certainly a policy direction in that regard. We focus on primary care and general practice, the C, and building on, we should hope it's a C, but building on strengths. So what's the Commonwealth, what does the Commonwealth say? The Commonwealth says a lot of things, but it can be reduced to this, really. They want to increase the efficiency and effectiveness of primary care, and there can be no, be no argument about that, really. And they want to improve the coordination of care, true. I mean, similar things have been said for the last 20 or 30 years. When, when you read through them and their documentation now, it's it clear they're moving away with this place-based approach and the adaptive approach that they're requiring or would like PHMs to follow. We're moving into the idea that we're actually maximizing public value. And public value, if you know about it, isn't isn't, isn't a, a standard measure, it's localised to place. What is valuable in, in Cathara, and what is judged to be valuable in Mandra, and what is judged to be valuable in, in Albany. 
are all quite different, and it's designed and it's that's determined by the local population. So we need a system of care in mental health and in other parts of health. A system of care in mental health that is adjusts and accommodates local local requirements and local value. And that's a challenge. We have we have a whole lot of guidance documents from the Commonwealth. Um, they're guidance to the PHN. We have a set the system conditions under which we in the PHN will design our model. So these guidance thing, describe things that are in scope. So what is definitely in scope is early intervention services, low intensity interventions. I'll talk a little bit about those later. Improving the coordination within and across the health system. Crucially, it's undertaken in a step care framework, and I'll talk a deal about step care because step care is fundamental to this model. And the implications of step care when you think through them, uh, change the nature of how we provide care in Western Australia or provide care across Australia. We're using a systems approach, so it's integration rather than the operation is separate. Clearly, if you, 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 you're moving away from a program based approach, you have to move to a systems approach. Innovative, pro well, looking at innovative approaches, um, balanced with current best evidence. So we have funding structures that allow us to build in innovation whilst providing ongoing support. Focusing on children and young people, remote, rural, <coughs> underserved, hard to reach. And the yeah, talked a little bit about the data about using data. Well, in, in, for many of the groups, the data isn't sitting in nice registers. Case registers, which are the traditional approach to planning, are, are just the people who turn up. It's based, it's almost, it's your sales data. It's not about a measure of need. It can be indicative of need, but it's also a reflection of the current provision of care as well. It's the, reflects the current organisation around health care. And so we have to be a bit smart about how we use data. I mean, if, you, if you think about the current morbidity registers, the latent structure effectively of the health system exists in the data set. I mean, Greylands Hospital exists in the data set because Greylands Hospital is there. And you have to be a little bit cautious about using that as if it's, as if it's uh, without bias. What is out of scope? Well, duplication, obviously. Replacement of existing services or funding shortfalls. Services better delivered by secondary and tertiary or the NDIS. So there's a degree of sensitivity about that, about where we end and NDIS starts. Similarly, a particular degree of sensitivity about where primary care ends and secondary starts at a state level. Commonwealth clearly they want us to be buffering up a secondary system and finding a withdrawal by the state. And activities not supported by some empirical base of evidence. Activities designed to address funding shortfalls, so not just filling the gaps. And capital expenditure, we're, we're not going to be building stuff. <coughs> we have investments in a funding pool. We have existing commitments. With, you know, Mental Health Nurse Incentive Program is an existing commitment that goes forward through to <coughs> the end of this financial year. We have ATAPs, which is a we inherited from the Commonwealth. Um, they made the determination to cease ATAPs and we will carry those contracts forward through till March. Interestingly, if you look across Australia um, in relation to ATAPs, some providers, will, some states have already stopped, some their agenda have already ceased it. Some are ceasing it this week. We're carrying it through until March. And that's, that was a Commonwealth, that's a Commonwealth decision. We're acting, acting we're just acting as a Commonwealth agent to uh, transition those services. And we have a pool from flexible and new investment, which is the of our AOD, suicide prevention, mental health and indigenous. We have a, and that pool of flexible will increase in its flexibility over time as the initial commitments of the contracts we signed going forward come into the, the funding comes into, moves away from the actual forward funding contract into new approaches as we change the system. What is the waffle way? The waffle way is person-centered care involved in GPs, and by GPs, I'm talking about medical officers or prescribers, supporting services in partnership with the people they care for. It's local by design and default, based on place-based, and when I say virtual pathways, we, it's, it's very interesting to look at primary care and the connection between primary care services in places. You know, most GPs will tell you they know who they refer to, but they often don't know who the people they refer to refer to. 
but they refer to a physiotherapist, you might refer to something else. And when you start tracking this, you find this, that these virtual precincts existing already, but they're not managing the precinct by. I think that, 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 that is an obvious target for um, innovation and improvement. GP led the care, we, we have a, um, an instruction, a direction or a policy direction in the Commonwealth, but GP should be at the centre of care and that GP care, GP led care is the norm, it's supporting the whole person. It's not saying that they have exclusive authority, but that just GP led care is the norm. We should be simplifying access and entry. Over the years I've heard, and probably all have heard, there's no wrong door, no wrong door, and thousands of wrong doors. I mean, and the more, every time someone says no wrong door, we seem to just add more doors. <laughs> and it doesn't simplify the process, it just makes it much more complicated. And you end up having really complicated maps to try and figure out your way through it. And even the, if you know the system is hard to navigate, I can't imagine what it's like if you don't know the system. We're going to be targeting low intensity psychological interventions. And it says that risk to mild to moderate, but also we have to believe that low intensity interventions have a role in people with severe mental disorder. And I'll talk a little bit about the changing understanding of what severe is from a Commonwealth perspective as we go forward. And then bridging the gap for people under service and hard to reach. And this is particularly an issue in the country Western Australia. I was looking at some data, I was talking to Linda about very low uptake of a particular service across the state, massive variation. And of course then I realised in some places there actually was no service. It wasn't a bit of low, it was just nil. So you have a program that actually has no reach out into some areas. I mean, and we have an obligation, I think, and an opportunity to do something about that. We're also going to support shared care systems for people with severe and complex. Shared care being that CL type relationship with, with a psychiatrist, usually supporting people in the <clears throat> Finding a better balance between meeting needs and available resources and community engagement and involvement beyond healthcare settings is essential. I'll talk a little bit later about community engagement. <coughs> it has to be beyond the people in this room. It has to be beyond what we our normal connections. It has to be into the deep structures of like the civil components of communities and cities. Um, we're framing our solutions by effective impact, effective impact on effectively, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that effective impact. That's a, bit, that's a challenge when you're moving away from program based funding to place based funding because you can't particularly attribute <coughs> to one component in that system the outcome. It's a collective outcome. Um, as the answer said, success is measured by place-based, not program-based, and a systems approach to enhancing public value, not managing by exception. By that, we don't just wait for a fault to occur and patch it up. We take a systems approach. <coughs> Prior to setting an expert advice, well, we have needs assessments and research partnerships, including the Curtin and the NBRI, the Mental Health and the Atlas, which is an intent at least to try and <coughs> map the provision of services, what people actually do services and the gaps. We have an expert, another drugs expert advisory group, uh, which advises us on uh, a whole range of matters. We have committees <coughs> that are regional and, uh, and metro-based, uh, chaired by, in most cases, I think in all cases, or in most cases, general all cases, general practitioner. And we have clinical engagement committees with uh, members of the public involved. We have a, a good relationship with the Department of Health. Um, <coughs> With the Health Commission, Granada, <coughs> and WAM, and others. Um, and the policy framework, we have an, a number, you know, the be better choices, better lives, new horizons, contributing lives, and thriving communities. It sets what we should be doing. It's not like we're, we're having to make this up. There's a lot out there telling us what to do. I was struck by what Fiona Stanley was saying this morning. I wasn't up at 3 a.m. listening to the arm, but I read the transcript, and you know, We've done endless reports, we, we just, but we don't actually do anything. And I was involved with, in, in 2000 and whatever with the, the uh, <coughs> council assisting the coroner into, into, into suicides in Perth. And a whole number of recommendations came out, and some were done. But we didn't grasp it and, 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 and change the way we work. The reform occurred in our heads somehow, and not on the ground. And we have to move away from reforming our thinking into reforming our actions and behaviours. And, I believe. And what I'm going to talk about hopefully will 
and some tools, for, some approach that would allow us to do that and give us the space to do that. So, and we're not just making it up here in Western Australia. This is part of the global trend. You know, coordination and integration of care, which should be severe and persistent mental illness and a single point of access is common now. That's an approach if you want to look at systems like, for example, in Seattle, chronic care models, or you want to look in Vermont and the management of people with PTSD and the VA systems, and that's where in Europe similar systems are used. Use of digital op options. Digital options are the future, so I'm told. And they're enormously variable. You can look at some apps. Uh, I was saying you know, in a meeting, if I made some claims about some of the apps that are available, if that was a powder, the TGA would prosecute me. You can say almost anything about apps. And there's no regulatory framework around that. And I think that, I think that, that needs to be addressed. And it's one of, you'll see we are, we'll, we'll show a degree of reluctance to enter the app market without such a regulatory framework. It just is too, too difficult. <coughs> and we want to see things that work rather than claims of great. You know, it's the silver bullet of an app. Although we do understand that e-health matters. And community care, we need to create alternative hospitalisation and a rapid retransition. Speak up, please, Sammy. We're losing a bit of sound back here. Oh, okay. Thank you. Sorry. I, might, I tend to talk quietly anyway, so. Yeah. Do you want me to yell? Yeah. <coughs> Sorry? Is it on? Is it on? Is this working? No. <laughs> so, it's not working. I'll take it off. Um, so, and we have to recognise comorbidity and assessing and treating mental ill health in those with other chronic long-term conditions and that, this is really important and it's one of the distinguishing features of primary care. If you look at, say, um, I'm not sure there's a slide on later, but if you look at the Grant Institute did a report recently into amateur care sensitive conditions in Victoria and in um, Queensland. Amateur care sensitive conditions are a list of common medical <coughs> problems and they were looking at differential rates of admission for those conditions, so that COPD or asthma, and commenting on some parts <coughs> of Queensland you have a 50% higher rate of admission if you have one of these conditions. What's interesting is not in the Grattan report is if, if you have a mental disorder of any level of diagnosis, or an ALD problem, you're 50% more likely to be admitted with an amateur care sensitive condition. You're going to spend twice as long in hospital and your cost of care will be twice as much. And you'll be discharged back to a place from which you're more likely to be admitted anyway. Now those figures of 50% are quite shocking. There are places in Western Australia where the figures are massively higher than that. Five, eight, nine times more likely to be admitted for an amateur care sensitive condition. And they're not all in the country. We have very big differences in the rates. And so GPs recognising and responding to those conditions wouldn't be seen in a mental health register because they're not admitted to hospital for mental problems. They're admitted to hospital for COPD or asthma or a dental problem or a urinary tract infection or a whole range of other conditions. So this is the question about surveillance and what is the role of primary care. That's what we all would want. You wouldn't want to be overdosed just because some... You know, some Treatment guidelines say this is the amount you need. So you need an assessment at the front end, adjusted for individual, and you just as you go forward, and that's a fundamental component of step care. It's an emergent system approach. It is the challenge in terms of, <coughs> of uh, well, this is a clinical model. The challenge, of course, is in a business is, is developing business models that are equally as adaptive. So the business model component of this is that will be a challenge for providers. So what is step care least burden? So treatment should be the least burden on the patient, the least restrictive, as well as on the care system in achieving positive <coughs> And the principle of self-correction, the intensity can be adjusted according to structured feedback and objective outcomes, providing for systematic clinical decision making. And that's just step care. And the implications of that when we read through it are really deep. They're really deep about how we would, how, how we, how we organise the provision of care around that. Because you're no longer treating care as widgets, but they're bundles of care that are adjusted to that person in the dose and intensity according to their local their need. And if you think in low intensity, low intensity is mostly high volume, 
not always high volume, it's mostly high volume. It may not be low intensity, it may be low intensity to the patient, but not always so. A person who's receiving the lowest curative dose of chemotherapy doesn't feel that they're particularly receiving a low intensity treatment. <coughs> One defining characteristic of low intensity, and it goes at the beginning, is this issue of high access. You have high access. And if you look across some of the programs, the access is just not there. And so we're looking to generate a framework that provides high access to these treatments. And they share the same principles of step care. So access, systematic measurement, adjustment, adjustment according to structured feedback. So LI is just a particular realization of step care. It's not different than step care, it's just a real, a different, it's a specification of step care. And that's just a common one. So how do we see this working? We see there's two components. We see a component here which we are calling collaborative care, in which the primary care clinical practitioner, who's usually a medical practitioner, will be the lead clinician, and they will be supported by a mental health care manager, usually a nurse, or described by usually a nurse, and they act as that the care manager for that practice. <coughs> They won't be in the practice in the main, they'll be on the phone. It's a phone-based system. If people are familiar with the approach Charles Gardner Hospital took to diabetes management and education, it's that form of model. The, 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 the coordinator is on the phone, phoning the patient, phoning the GP. So that is collaborative care. The other component is this issue of you right. This is this is this is this is shared care. Shared care, and it's not popular with general practitioners. Shared care. It's not popular because of the way it's been enacted. So I'll say you know, the first appointment is great, the psychiatrist turns up. And the second appointment, well, the registrar turns up. And the third appointment's an apology, and they feel they've been left managing somebody whose uh, care needs are beyond their skill set. So they don't wish to engage. And that, if you look at that, you'll find, for example, I think it's for more. 85% of the shared care is done by 15% of the GPs. And the figures step down from that. 75% is done by 10% of the GPs, and 65% is done by 5% of the GPs. That's not a broad primary care approach. That's a number of specialist general practitioners who've got particular interest in mental health. There are general practitioners in North who have caseloads greater than psychiatrists in the public health system. <coughs> we have to get over that. How do we change that? We change that by focusing on this group first. Collaborative care. So collaborative care, which is that notion of the person on the phone who's going to organise the care. If you look and think through it, perhaps <coughs> when you, a general practitioner, most people who've got anxiety or depression will go to their GP. GP care alone is sufficient. They're relatively self-sufficient in their lives. They have the session with the GP every six weeks for a period of time. The treatment works, and or they self-seek other treatments and supports themselves. They don't need some. They don't need care coordination or care management. But a proportion do. Maybe 15, maybe 10 percent need different amounts of care management. And we we call this because it's called this in the literature measurement based care part of the role of the care manager is to measure the person's progress against using standardized measures that can be reported back to the general practitioner so that they can have their 10 minute meeting with the patient and make a care choice in that meeting without having to seek extra information it's very difficult in your 10 or 15 minutes to formulate a response when the person turns up with a whole lot of questions and this is to support general practitioners. The care manager can carry about 50 to 60 patients on their caseload. It's been estimated. 50 to 60 is based on the US, <coughs> mostly managing people with PTSD. We actually have a suspicion that it can be higher in Western Australia. And the predominant group of people with anxiety disorders and major depression disorders, and problematic but not, um, not dependent alcohol and drug use. And that's the, that's the vast bulk of what will be occurring in primary care and general practice. And shared care, which is predominantly people with severe and persistent mental illness, we'll be looking to 
general practitioners have a small caseload for, for general practitioners. But, the, but the, the big game will be collaborative care. What's the, why do general practitioners do this? Um, well, general practitioners will enter shared care arrangements if they feel supported. And it requires the state-based system to, to buy into it. General practitioners won't do it if they don't feel supported or they're not actually supported. Again, it requires a state <coughs> system to engage. So what is the care manager function? Well, it works with the GPs, primary care physicians, and in some cases, nurse practitioners, because that's the person providing the primary care. They have a role in illness education, treatment decision support, so in advance of um, appointments, discussing with the patient their, tr their treatment, how it's progressing, and what choices they might have. Medication management, particularly measuring treatment outcomes, GP charting, progressing, measuring the progress of people over time in a format that GPs can easily apprehend, so the person's moved over time. If it's going you know, into deteriorating. And troubleshooting. An example would be the troubleshooting. I talked to Tim Carr about this. He said it's very common you have patients who max out on their antidepressants. The maximum dose he feels comfortable providing <coughs> in general practice. And when they then have a meeting, he's trying to work out options forward at that point. It'd be very useful if the nurse had contacted the psychiatrist in advance, discussed the possible options and noted them on the chart. So the general practitioner then has some options to discuss. And the nurses talk to the patient about it in advance of the meeting. So they have some context when they start their, start their, their appointment. Same thing would be noting it's, it's diabetes. If the patient, you're tracking their blood sugars, and you notice one day it just goes up, you phone the patient and ask, you know, were you feeling a bit fluid? Did you have a sandwich or a drink the night before? And track it so that you're not responding to abnormal findings just because they look they're just there. And deals with all of that room <coughs> background stuff. Organising follow-up and referrals, linking into community support, and in time providing themselves structured interventions. And facilitating specialist consultation. And the expectation was they have a relationship with the psychiatrist providing the shared care. That's who they'll be discussing this case of. And that's that's the buy-in for general practice to get into shared care. And it's the buy-in for the state-based system too. Because if you think about those the group of patients I talked about before, or the people with anti care sensitive conditions, they're the people who are turning up in the hospital. They're the people who are in the emergency departments. They're the people having admissions twice as long as they ought to. So there is a, there is a drive for the state to be involved. Psychological therapy, structure, psychology. <coughs> We have a view that this will be phone-based. Why phone-based? Phone-based because it gets the reach across the state for us. It gets over those massive inequities of access. It also works. Phone-based, structured psychological therapy works. Therapists sometimes don't like it. They like to have first meeting, second meeting, third meeting. But people like it. Most people find it better than face-to-face. -face -face. It's more convenient. I'm doing some work with a colleague on sleep-based structured psychological therapies. <coughs> People who've got sleep problems. So it means the person who's tired, maybe on, a, maybe on a benzodiazepine, hypnotic, doesn't have to drive to the clinic in the morning. They can have their treatment anywhere in the state. We just have to work with them gentleman who's retired who was able to go to Broome during his treatment because he didn't have to come into Perth. And it worked. Remarkably effective. Three, three appointments and he's he's with this chap sleeping without the use of anti without a hypnotic. <coughs> the crucial part of it of this is it's a GP referred process. The GP is referring people in. It's not a self-referral system. And the, what you'll have at the front end is an expert assessment. So it's not a pro flow entry where the first person you're speaking to is going through that kind of, you know, how are you feeling today, yes, no answers. It's actual expert at the front, 
book and clinic will be out. Telephone clinic but it will operate Monday to Friday, 9 to 5, Western Australia time. Maybe I'll put that later, but it'll be a standard Monday to Friday clinic. And that assessment will lead to, in a step care way, into a judgment about the individual's need and requirements for psychological therapy. And they will commence on that course according to their need, and it will be adjusted according to need as you go forward. With structured monitoring and reporting back to the general practitioner, using the same format we would have for the care coordinator. So the GP will see one chart that's care coordination, and one chart that's structured psychological therapy, one chart. This will be available to um, any general practice in the state. Now there's an issue about we're required to um, ensure low intensity structure psychological therapy. But of course, in rural and remote areas, maybe metro maybe even, we have to have a system that will also step up to a bit more intensity because there is no one to refer to in, what was the place you were telling me, Dumble, Dumble Young? Young. Dumble Young. There's, there's no <coughs> high intensity service to refer to. So we, have an, we would have an expectation that a component of this would be able to step up and offer those high, more intense psychological therapies to the extent that the evidence supports the model. And there will be a component necessarily of face-to-face where face-to-face -face is indicated. Face-to-face -face is likely to be, we would think, you know, is group-based, but some individual-based according to local needs. But the principal bulk of this will be by telephone. <coughs> the principal bulk will be by telephone. Part of it also would be, there would be a training node to come off this service, which would be local based, which we would have an expectation would be from CERT 2 all the way through to exposing people to the masters in psychology or this. So that we can develop local capacity to deliver these allied services as they come on stream. But the literature in this area is evolving all the time. Every Therapy you see that, that is offered in face to face, within two years a version can be offered by telephone. Eating disorder is an example. I worked for long, many years in eating disorders research, <coughs> managing eating disorder services. You know, there's, there's a service in the centre of Perth, CCI. It's, it's world class. I mean, it's, it's one of the best eating disorder services in the world. It's got a six month waiting list. Is that good? But not everyone can afford to wait six months. And we need to simply with sleep. We've got one of the, we've got one of the world's best sleep clinics in Charles Gardner. Similarly, you can wait six months. We need to be able to step care away from those tertiary facilities out into where people actually are doing their work. The chap who was receiving his psychological therapy was driving his combine harvester back and forth. Somebody was telling me a story about Gardner guy in New Zealand, New South Wales, I think. He would on a GPS tractor do his therapy whilst he was still you know, do, doing the, his work. It would still work. And we have to be responsive to that. And not waiting for making people or requiring people to be really sick before they get care. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Making the threshold really high, and as the money dries up, making it even higher, it doesn't work. If you do that, care goes, you get more failure and care goes. Costs go up, you just make it much more costly. Um, <coughs> Community support services are crucial to our, our model because they're the component that localizes the model in the place. So you have a phone-based psychological therapy, that's fine, people have got universal access to that. You've got a GP who's going to provide treatment, <coughs> fine, that's, that's, that's common business, that's business as usual with some support. What's really crucial and what localizes the model and what is central to the model are these community support services. And they wrap around the person, they support the care continuum, and they're the, they're the face of the person you'll see, they're the face in your local community, and they should provide low intensity interventions, the brief interventions, and they support those who self refer and are referred by GPs. And they do a range of things from short term low intensity work groups, one up interventions, referral sessions. High intensity psychological therapies, non their mental conditions, it's a whole range of things these lo and they're locally determined, but they, they're determined by the local priority. So what you require in Double Young might be different than what you require in Nicotara, it's likely to be. 
And that's where the local commissioning components come in. And that's the, is the crucial local flavor of our model. And that's where the local by design occurs. Where from here? Change management and transition. We know that ATAX ceases in March, and there's a transition plan around that for the agencies that are managing ATAPs or developing their transition plans. Our commissioning, um, they're mixed processes. We have a range of options that we can use, and so we'll be using that range of options. If you want to, on the website, the Waffle website, it's a very good uh, description of the commissioning process and the detail. It's a phased approach. We're not, we're not doing all of this on the first, I'm hoping not doing all this on the 1st of January, no. I think we're talking about five, five months, yeah, five months. Um, the, the, the telephone based psychological therapy is our, is our priority at the moment. We're looking for, Commonwealth wants us, and we ought to have a deal of stakeholder engagement. Sometimes the timelines come off. They'll ask for a, 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 a co produced, co engaged, deeply consultative process. And no, by the way, could you have it with us in three weeks? So, to the extent we can, we need to have consumer and care engagement guided by the sector, and building on existing mechanisms. It's not our intention to crack a whole new sector engagement system, you know, consumer engagement system, patient engagement system. We, there are plenty of these. We've got Primary Health Exchange, which Leon has um, highlighted. If you're interested, join the discussion. You can, it's an active forum. We have our Waffle website, and we do industry briefings, and particularly around the EOI, Comprehensive primary care and publications and resources. We put a lot of stuff out there. Coming from a system, I was in North Metro for a number of years. You don't put a lot of stuff out. The stuff you put out is kind of you know, mundane, so the least. We're putting stuff out all the time. It's updated, and this is kind of a journey for us too. We're creating. We want to create a system where the um, the care is adapted to the person, so the system adapts according to the care needs of the community. And to do that, we need businesses and, and providers who are also business models that can manage that adaptation, <coughs> which will be the challenge to you. We're not expecting you to do it, we're doing it ourselves internally, which is a challenge, I can tell you. And we're not expecting you to do it alone. We have the capacity to engage, to meet with, talk through the models as, to the extent we can, and listen and take feedback from you about how this can be enacted for the betterment of the health of all West Australians, because this is what it's about. This is what it's about. Um, I'd just like a show of hands first. Um, who in the room um, works for an agency that does actually deliver services in country WA. Okay, yep. Um, who delivers services that are available to people in country WA? A few more. Okay. Um, so about 20% of WA's population lives in country WA. Um, two and a half million square kilometres to cover. Um, over 90% of it is either classed as remote or very remote. Translate that into a little bit of service or no service. Um, as Danny mentioned, um, <coughs> we just picked a, a town in country WA, it just happened to be Dunkle Young. Um, going through the current um, ATAPS um, information, um, finding, okay, there's never been, well, as much as we can ascertain, anyone from Dumbuyang who has received a service under ATAPS. You know, if they have, then they've been um, living in a different postcode area whilst they've received it. So, you know, part of what we're trying to do is about service equity, to try and ensure that no matter where you are, if you have um, a mental health condition, if you have ideas of suicide, or if you have drug and alcohol um, you know, problematic use, that there is something there for you. And that just because you happen to live in a country area or you know, a remote area, you should not um, have to worry about whether or not you can access a service. 
So when Danny talks about um, you know, telephone access, most people in country WA do have access to telephones. And in fact, some have quite good access, some have access to internet, some don't. So we're trying to build, I suppose, a mixed mode of um, service delivery that will cover um, access across the whole of the continuum um, and ensure that people can get a service and don't have to come to Perth if they have a mental health problem. So that's the, the foundation for what we're working from. Um, that being said, we also know that we need to ensure that there are complementary services around um, communities. So um, those of you who are aware and, and work in Country WA, hopefully you will have had some contact with WAFA, Country WA, PHN staff um, in the seven regional areas. So we do have staff located in each of the seven country regions. Um, and there's a manager there who um, has been doing, you know, in most instances will have been doing quite a bit of work with service providers around, okay, let's look at what the service needs are in this community. So, um, in addition to the um, clinical commissioning committees that, um, that Danny spoke about, that we have in each of these regions, there are also some um, working groups on mental health and AOD that are um, comprised of um, local um, clinicians who have been providing advice to the clinical commissioning committees to support them in developing um, design principles, I guess, that will um, help us to operationalise the models and so forth. Um, one of the benefits, as has been pointed out, of having a PHN approach is that localised um, option. So we're not looking to build a service delivery system that looks the same across country WA or across the whole of WA. What we're trying to build is something that has a foundation and then can be localised. So in each of the regions it will look different and already there are some elements that are being developed um, through either um, commissioning processes or through a direct approach. So. For example, in the southwest of WA, um, we uh, realised that um, there was very little there in terms of Aboriginal mental health. The AMS in that region did not have access to the social and emotional wellbeing funds that are provided in a number of other um, AMSs. So the clinical commissioning committee there decided that that was actually a priority for them. So they um, did some direct negotiation with the Aboriginal Medical Service in that area and a contract has now been let for Aboriginal mental health in the South West that will service not just Bunbury but outlying communities and that they will work in conjunction with mainstream service providers to help build the capacity into that AMS. So that's one example of taking um, a localised approach. Um, other things that we're trying to do is build the relationships with other funders. So, for example, the Mental Health Commission and the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. Um, last week? Yeah. Last week I was in Alice Springs meeting with um, NG Health who provide um, the uh, medical services to 11 remote communities across central WA. Um, we were talking about um, mental health service provision, alcohol and drug service provision and suicide prevention. But that wasn't just WAFA alone. I went with colleagues from um, the Mental Health Commission and from Prime Minister and Cabinet. So we're talking about a collaborative approach to the provision of funding for services across that region. Um, because it's not the sort of thing that you can just put a little bit of money in here and a little bit there. And we're even talking, oh my God, about having one service delivery contract that will um, have you know, the, the service provider reporting only once rather than you know, on three different levels. Danny tells me that might be a bit difficult given some of the, um, the data um, requirements, but we're certainly going to try and work as much as possible to that you know, um, objective. <coughs> Another one is in Meekathara where we've been working with WACS and um, the Mental Health Commission around the development of um, a combined service in that community. So we're trying to look at where the obvious gaps are and, and get in and fill those immediately. Then you will have found particularly um, those of you who are maybe existing service providers in the AOD space um, where you may have had conversations with um, our managers. I know 
Sheila, there's been some conversations in the southwest and Great Southern about how there could be, um, you know, uh, an enhancement of services <coughs> in those areas. So again, we're trying to see what can be done in each of the areas to build on the strengths that are in those communities, um, but also to fill the gaps and make sure that people aren't disadvantaged just because they happen to live in a remote area. So that's probably, um, I don't want to go into a lot of the specifics, but I'll hand over to Bernie and she can tell you the differences between country and, and metro approach. Thank you. <coughs> Morning everyone. Um, so from a metro perspective, I guess, um, there's a few things to, um, to sort of cover off. One is that we have Vast geographical location, even in metro, not quite as vast as country. <laughs> but lots of services, obviously. Um, lots of interfaces with services, or perhaps even not interfaces with services. So what we're trying to do from a metro perspective is really build that connectivity between different services and also between our tertiary systems and our secondary and primary care systems. So what we want to do is really start to... to to make the journey for a patient much more accessible, easy, um, and where those vulnerable communities are and where those vulnerable patients are, they're getting the help that they need. So um, just a few examples from Metro. One, I can see Deb sitting there in the front row. One is um, with Rua that we're working with them on a homelessness project. So uh, in ours, there's a support service, um, a care coordination support <coughs> service that's being funded by a charitable organisation. And in the after hours period, the Metro um, PHNs are funding two different after hours services, um, sorry, not different, but the same services in Metro in North and South, um, which is part of the 50 Lives for 50 Homes project. So that's about keeping people well and in their houses um, or in their newly, in their new housing. Um, in the after hours period and, and linking in primary care and also um, psychological support for those people. Um, we have other services, uh, for example, with Street Doctor in, um, in Perth North. And again, that's about bringing primary care to, um, to patients, but also, I guess, from a mental health perspective, really starting to wrap those services around those patients and AOD as well. So um, some short-term grants that we've put in place with existing Commonwealth um, providers who some of you in the room would have been, um, would be having conversations with us about that um, until June. So we've, um, we've allowed some additional treatment services from those particular services and our mental health and alcohol and other drug treatment um, map is starting to tell us about what those services are that are currently in place and what we need to sort of think about in other metropolitan locations that currently might not be getting services. So um, that's that's the approach from a metro perspective. Um, I guess I could talk a lot longer, but I won't. <laughs> I won't, I won't <laughs> so I might open it up to questions. Um, and I've lost Danny. <coughs> oh, back down there. So Danny's there and Linda's here as well, if anyone would like to ask questions. <coughs> Hi, I'd just like to build down a little into the equity of access and the bridging the gap uh, mm -hmm. issues, particularly as they relate to what's in scope and what's out of scope. Um, I represent a disability support organisation that operates in the South West where the WAMDIS trials come, mm -hmm. model has been implemented. One of our biggest growth areas has been in, in the provision of support to people with psychosocial disabilities. Mm -hmm. Now, psychosocial disability, when you look into it, it's chronic and severe mental illness, persistent severe mental illness. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not sure exactly what, um, in what way WAFA will articulate with the disability sector, given that there's this now sort of mental health invisible group. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the guidance around that is clearly Commonwealth exclude psychosocial support from our so we're, and, I, and I guess, Michael, the sensitivity initially is they didn't want all 31 PHNs across Australia interrupting their, in their AS initiative. And we're discovering over time that you know, with representation that can be adjusted because psychosocial support is not excluded from the AOD component. So we, we've, a set, we've got a number of funding schedules 
it don't, I think it's important not to think of the funding schedules as if they're programs anymore. So we would be looking in many cases to a blended model. So where there's a need for psychosocial support and there's an identified AOD problem, <coughs> that could be the component of a service we would seek to fund, even if another component of that service was focused on mental health and suicide prevention. So we can be adaptable around it to the extent that the guidance permits. It's not about gaming the system, it's about working within that guidance. The, 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 there's not perfect alignment in the guidance between the AOD, suicide prevention, and the uh, mental health. Um, it's, I think it'd be fair to say, over time, the Commonwealth will gain more trust in our, us, I hope, and will adjust. For example, telephone-based brief interventions are generally excluded for AOD in the guidance, but as 11 or 12 of the PHNs have submitted exception applications, <coughs> and they've all have been granted through that. It's about moving from this program-based system into a more place-based without it getting too much contamination in, in the reporting structures. But you're, you're right. This, if, you look at, if you look at the public mental health system with people with long-term conditions, probably only one in eight of those individuals will, will, will meet NDIS. I do a seven, seven out of eight. Right? And that, that, those individuals still require care. They still require care, of which a very significant component is psychosocial. Very significant. Liz, probably just worth adding to that. Sorry, I've got my coat on because it's about three degrees in the front row. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sure when I can press for this. Um, that, that group, for example, and we're a little bit agnostic on one hand, is that if you take that population group, and I think the point was raised earlier, that that population group that you're supporting have in the past had very limited access to good primary health care and often suffer with chronic diseases. So there's another lens to put across that. Uh, that is helpful, not unhelpful. So, I mean, that group would benefit enormously from access to a good primary health care. Yeah, absolutely, that's right. absolutely. And so that's the thinking to do. Most of the figure quoted, the national the state plan, they quoted the figure of 42 patients could be discharged from grade. Yeah, I mean, that was, I did that piece of work, so I know the figure. And it truly is the reason why they can't, they could not be discharged, is not about their mental state, it's about the complete lack of psychosocial support. And lack of appropriately specified accommodation. It's not about diagnosis of schizophrenia. Um, and we, 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 can, we, we can come up, we can come up and butt up against that, but we, there is issues about how far we can, we, can, we, we can push to the side. So the issue for me is around um, the figures that people with severe mental illness are dying 25 years younger, younger oh, yeah. That's right. because of treatable Design. Yeah, that's correct. And so the lens, although you're not supporting psychosocial support, if it was um, as a way to reconnect people with <coughs> primary care yeah. and health giving yeah. practices, one would hope we'd be we, more we, favourably on it. We haven't sought clarification of the definition of what psychosocial support yeah. means. Mm -hmm. We're taking that in clarity, it's not in clarity, in clarity as a, a room to make a choice, <coughs> we can define um, components of support that have a psychological element that would meet the Commonwealth definition. Yeah. I mean, I think it's probably I mean, it's worth... Clear, you're absolutely right. Yeah. It, yeah. If you take, again, there's some, I was involved in some of the studies that looked at this, and it, yeah. it's, 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 it's catastrophic. And, and, and I think people. what we're saying too is, um, and I think the AOD sector would also say this, that general practice, general, this is a generalisation, haven't been good at working with people mm -hmm. who have a, have a required treatment, my words, mm -hmm. not the best way to say that, and, um, and similarly haven't been good at working with people who have a, a, an enduring mental illness and their chronic disease issues. Mm -hmm. So we know we've got two quite um, significant pieces of work there to do to enable that to improve. And uh, we're not saying all the answers sit there, but we're going to have to enable that if people, in terms of equity of access, mm -hmm. are going to start to get either good screening and treatment when they do go to see a GP, or indeed helping them 
to establish a relationship with primary care so that they can continue that. So that is clear. And general practice talk to us about how tricky this is. Mm. So part of our role is to enable that. Hence, when we look at place, it's engaging with general practice in that so we can start to address some of the barriers mm. in a good and proper way. Mm -hmm. So that both general practice feels like it can develop the capability, but it also has good relationships with the provider system, mm -hmm. knows who to talk to, where to go, and so forth. So mm -hmm. that's the place-based <coughs> approach. So there's a question, or two questions. I was just going to add to that, Leanne, to us, because um, at state level, there's been a lot of conversation in the last decade, particularly the last five years around GPs needing to be primary health and being the experts at primary health and all of us needing to coalesce around them. And my question is, does WAPA have funding? Because we all know that GPs are uneven in their capacities and their skill at managing mental health and some of them are actually not willing to really engage in that space much. Um, do you have funding and do you have it as part of your mandate to train GPs and to, to be more adept and skilled, basically, at managing mental health, and do you have any means that you've worked out about oh, how you're going to do that? At the end of the day, there's really good GP training programs. Sorry? There's really, there are really good there, GP there training good programs. Modules, yeah. What we need is general practice to attend. Yes. <laughs> uh, sorry, and, and to assist and enable <coughs> that. And, um, we think that, look, there will be GPs who go, you know what, I'm, I'm going to move into this space, but they want to know they're going to be supported. I mean, part of their dilemma has been in the past, they've either a, not known who to refer to, or felt like they're holding a high risk topic that they, and so building around general practice is one of those to start to assist them undertake their own training and build interest. So we wouldn't ever duplicate what's available, but we plug that in. So we do work very closely with the college yeah. because they're responsible for training. Oh, yeah. Similarly, we work really closely with WAGPET in training the next generation of GPs and giving them a different exposure to the world at large, uh, both in country, remote locations, <coughs> as well as out of metro, as part of the enabling. So um, we work quite collaboratively to make that happen rather than drop something in on the top of that. Yeah, and the reason why I'm asking is because <coughs> the model that you're setting up in terms of step uh, care is highly dependent on GPs. Yeah. Absolutely. Is there, is there going to be a mechanism or a feedback loop? You're talking about getting the committee to give evidence and to give feedback and look, about to be, how that's working. To be honest, uh, most practices today, if you said, do you know the health needs of your community, <coughs> do you know what the supply prevalence looks like, and you know this is what's happening, they'd say no. And that's because they've never been provided that picture before, and we have <coughs> started saying, you know, in this community, this is what's actually happening, did you know? They know from who they see, but they don't actually see it on a population or community yeah. base. So part of the change management is providing that information into general practice, but also to service providers. <coughs> so that service providers can go, oh, we'll fancy that. So you know, so that's part of the change management. Goal. And we're investing quite a bit into that data analytics side and that visualisation and that feedback and almost like that public health observatory by region so that people can have not not swamped by information but they can actually see the critical measures of their community so you know and we're, we're doing some work at the department at the moment we're doing some work with curtain and we we have plans for the future to be pushing this information out so people can say this is my community this is what it looks like so, and also working with you know, Wal Walga and, and local government in particular around this, so that people understand the, their place. What, what, and our, we mentioned hotspots, and hotspots are quite interesting because everybody in this room could name the 10 hotspots, the top of the peak. We could all just list them off in terms of places. But it's the next level, as we go through those you know, red hotspots, is what's the next level down? What are the, what are the subtle differentiation between coastal Rockingham and Mandra inland? Where, as you start to come off the really hot areas, where, what are the, which are the really local differences? You know, I was looking at emission rates, for example, present, emission, presentation rates for triage level five by suburbs, and per, triage five, which is healthy, sort of as indicator of primary care capacity in an area. And you've got a two and a half fold difference in some suburbs. 
you know, well, why is that? Going in, is it, is, is, is it need to go in locally? We don't we'll know the answer. We come along to the local providers and community and say, in the face, in the face of this information, what's going on? Because the intelligence will come from the community, not from people looking at spreadsheets. In, and, and so the Atlas is, the, that we mentioned earlier is one strand of that. And that will be open domain for you as providers to use. We don't, it's not just for us, because you need to know that as much as we need to know that. And we'll keep adding to those open source information sets over time. Because if you're, you're all running organisations and you need to grow, develop, reshape, you know, etc., and you need this information as much as we do from a planning perspective. And our experience to date is, is fantastic information, but it all comes in a single slice of pie, disconnected from another piece, and it's when you start to join up the pieces of the pie that you get a really different flavour. <coughs> so we will develop that over time, and we'll try to make sense of that internally as we put that up so if people can read it and understand it. There was another question right down the back. Um, I'm inquiring about the Mental Health Nurse Prevention Program that's been um, sort of axed and we have a bit of a fight with the more people regarding our funding. Oh, so it's sort of just doing talks about Is this in metropolitan Perth or country? We're in Perth. You're in Perth? You want to have it? You want to pick this up? Because there's a history here longer than our arm, which you know you may or may not know, but there'll be changes in this program, which is about getting equity across Australia, yep. which is a great thing for WA because WA is one of the lowest funded programs. I think it is the lowest. So, yeah, the lowest. WA did 48,000 last year. I think it was 48,000 the case, not called the case of the service, but yeah, the case of the service equivalent. And in the same period, I think Victoria did 585,000. They're only 2.2 times bigger than us. So Western Australia has the, by far the, mm. the mainland state and the lowest. They've got three, or They've got three yeah. regions in country, Western Australia. Yeah. But we're happy to talk to you individually because yeah, this I'm that right. program is really important into the future. Well, so we have two mental health nurses, and they did want to know and put on another two because we need them. And that they tried to cut our funding off just four to me, but most of from the Mental Health Nurse Incentive Program because they cut it. And now um, we're trying to fight again now with WAPA to top this back up again. So I, I'm, I, I can talk to that later on, no. but I might just give a quick little bit of history, which is um, in the north for our Mental Health Nurse Incentive Program in the Perth North PHN, that particular program came into us from the Commonwealth with a certain um, funding allocation, so a contract funding allocation. So we were only able to extend the contracts for the next 12 months exactly the same as they've been delivered in the past 12 months. Um, and the allocation of funding that came to us was exactly for that amount of work. Um, so if your program's in the north, that may have been what, what has happened. But happy to have a chat later on about that. Apart from that, that little telephone, that's all right, sorry, it's not a song, it could be, you know, usually it's a bad song, isn't it? <coughs> Is, let me just see if there are other questions. Yeah, I was just in, uh, interested in the, I mean, I've heard you speak before about the intersection with secondary or tertiary in terms of the amount of people that are visiting emergency centres that would normally be, in particularly those in the space of mental health, I would assume AOD, mm -hmm. and in the homelessness space. Um, so you've got some data, but what is the what are you thinking in terms of how not so much resolution, but the strategy towards we're doing a little bit of the <coughs> fifty homes, fifty lives with the connection, but there's just a whole another body of work. There is a whole other body of work which okay. There we go. Yeah. So one of the issues of the ED emergency departments is that we triage up. So and um, if you have an we would like an enrich program to mm from the emergency department. It tends to be that the, 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 the kind of uh, dogma of an ED is you triage people up and you, you operate from the top down, the ones down to the fives. And so we find, for example, frequent attenders who are triage five have an average, they breach, they average, they, they wait 5.1 hours in North Metro. Um, because they're not getting care and then they wait. And our view is that we should do a reverse triage 
So we should be going into the emergency department and taking, moving out the people who are the least sick first, those easiest to place. That's slightly antithetical to the way MEDs work and slightly antithetical to the way I used to you know, get other practically five years ago, the daily breaches, which is about systems conditioned up. But we were thinking, of go, you go in and you remove those people who are the, the most straightforward to place, those with just poor, a little bit poorly buffered who can do with some support to get back on their feet. Don't create a system that conditions people to be really, really sick. <coughs> David Dalton gave a great presentation when I was in North when he was here, and he basically said that during the G he runs Salford Trust in the UK. During the GFC, every nearly every trust in the UK, when they got them big budget cuts, you know, 10% of their budget cut, many of them made it more harder to get in the hospital, and progressively their costs went up, progressively sicker, and didn't spontaneously recover. And he did the reverse. He, he, he said, oh, look, if a person is turning up in Salford or infirmary or a pension of a split toenail, we should fix it. We shouldn't refer the person somewhere. We should fix it. And when he did this, his costs went down. And Salford last year went into the red by two million pounds. I mean, if you're a health executive, you were two million pounds in Western Australia really, you know, celebrating. <laughs> you see, and it was a different dynamic. He was saying you design against demand. If the demand is pensioners turning up in broken tunnels, you fix it. You don't wait for that person to go away. It to get worse, then to get septicemia, start taking aspirin for the pain, and end up in the ICU. That's, that's a challenge for the system. And we've had initial discussions with, and we're talking about English to Charles Gardner and to Walker, about doing such a system and placing people quickly and promptly back and not going to the sickest person first because that's what we think is part of the problem. And building then, obviously, different capability in the community, I don't mean different, but more of it, uh, and also engaging, as we've said far earlier, intervention primary care so that people aren't going there as their first option, but second or third. But there will be, there are communities of people who've always gone to an emergency department mm -hmm. because that's what they do. And so that's nearly a full behaviour change. Uh, and so again, it's that issue that we try to stop just that sore toe first rather than the behaviour change of people who have worn a very regular past for years on years. But yes, so we do work with the hospitals Clearly, this is an issue for them, but uh, it's a big change also. Can I just ask a question about the workforce? Um, are you anticipating that the specialist mental health workforce will be in the specialist areas, or are we expecting to see a specialist primary care mental health and AOD workforce? And what is the mechanism? A separate for workforce. That? I don't think we have an intention to create a separate workforce. Where, um, Examples of where, where it's been tried in Australia around low intensity have had variable outcomes. Generally, the workforce turnover has been very high. We see it better to look at our existing workforce where they are and train them to provide a different type okay. of care. But then, buffer that by having phone access. Look at the, the country, the cost of providing a nurse in some country areas is phenomenal. If we can provide, if we can create this phone-based psychological therapy, it draws back some of that costs, and then keep that fund money can be reinvested properly into that community, not to do the basic phone-based psychological therapies, which is just able to be done by the phone, but investing what's locally needed. And I think that will be our approach to developing workforce in place. Is that, that, does that answer your question, or is there something else? No, there's no, something no. else you're trying to ask. Um, yeah. Do you, given that we've got a, a high physical health comorbidity with our people with mental illness, basically we want people with mental illness to go to primary health to get yeah. their physical health care needs. Can't do that by phone. No, that's you right. need to have somebody supporting the GP and your that's and your right. and your model say that it's got to be a allied health person or a, or a nurse or whatever working with the GP. Where does that come from? Is that going to be oh, an attachment? Centralised phone system, you that? No, no, no. 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 And I mean, it's complex so primary care. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. Primary. So, so I guess my question is, if you're going to have allied health and nurses supporting GPs, looking after people with mental illness, getting their physical health care needs met, 
where are they going to come from? Are you going to use the existing mental health force, which is um, basically in crisis within the tertiary system, or is there another mechanism that we can use to actually upskill people who, with mental health, um, you know, expertise within the primary health system? So I don't think we're going to build off the back of the currently stressed public system because it's too busy. We'll be looking at a more generic mm. workforce. So is there, which, so how are we going to upskill that more generic yeah. workforce? We depend on the component you're looking at. So if you look at low intensity treatments, which we would want to increase over time the capacity that mm. workforce would deliver, we would look to build that off the back of our telephone based hub, which would be based in Perth. So we often train <coughs> around low intensity. We can't move from our current system, which is the high intensity, to a low intensity model overnight. This is going to be a journey we work on going forward. You know, nurses, nursing in Western Australia, um, it's a little bit of nursing, is hospitals, in mental health, training is hospital centric, principally. Most, nurse, most nurses who do their training do their training in hospitals, and most mental health placements are hospital based placements. Isn't, Western Australia is unusual in, in nursing, in a sense, in the public system. But it's unusual to find level one nurses working in the community, level one nurses working, level yeah, two nurses working. Yeah, and I think, and I think we have to readdress that 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 arrangement of nursing, which is a which is a challenge for the state. But there are we've had approaches from a number of academic institutions who are interested in looking at innovative placements because they can see the future being a different form of provision. So I think you're looking at you know person-centred um, training and, and service delivery. When you look at the particular persistence of the mental health issues that affect the high of people community, their needs aren't necessarily clinical. No, that's right. right. They're no. largely social. Yeah. Uh, and there was some work done by the Commonwealth, I was involved in it some years back, where we looked at readmission rates. And rather than focus on those people who came back to hospital, we looked at those people who stayed out of hospital yeah, and what, and what were the factors that led to the success of those people. And it wasn't clinical services. Support. It was support. Support. community based support. Yeah. The roof over the head, somebody to help with budgeting, shopping, uh, meaningful human interaction. They're all the important things that help keep people and survive in the community. So I, I think it takes a bit of a paradigm shift in what is mental health support. Um, it, it takes a huge shift. And we, I mean, this is the, I think what we're trying, my view is, is encouraging the care manager function and, and the telephone based psychological therapy is to create the breathing space for these local support services to develop because too much is invested in the treatment in my view too much is invested in the, treat, the pure treatment somatic side of mental health i mean if you look at this model this is come this bit down here which is i used to work in which is the one percent group that's 90 percent of the budget the total budget 90 percent all the rest Yes, 10%. And, and to be fair, uh, Very expensive treatment centre model. There are things going on in the country, and I think is it called Grow Local in Kalgoorlie, yeah. which goes to the point of workforce, looking at that community, what's required, how do we locally grow the capability, building on either the existing workforce or adding in some new things, but that's a local response in Kalgoorlie around this topic. So while I don't think we've answered at all your question fully, uh, what, and we look at workforce, we're at that sort of poise point of what are the skill sets required, where are the gaps, we know that there's a supply issue in the country and we're clear about that, uh, but that might see emerging in new different workforce groups over time uh, and similarly for us as Aboriginal health workers are critical in this environment, so there's a range of those that we need to work around, but I think it's the balance between the support functions, as you say, rethinking that and what is clinical treatment or low intensity. But there's no doubt we've got you know, a role in advocating. We won't do a lot of workforce development. That's really, while workforce is key, building workforce for the future, but we've got to try to marry that in a sort of a soft way as we go forward with commission. But I think it'll articulate in time, says I. Uh, are there other, any other burning questions? I see that we're at 12.15. We've had a few people clearly have to run, uh, which I appreciate. Are there, and we, we're clearly here for the next little while, so happy to take one-on-one -on -one and talk and chat. And there's a few other staff here, so they can make themselves known to talk uh, with you as well. 
So, uh, is there anything else, Bernie, or are you happy to do one-on-ones as we wind up? One-on-ones. One-on-ones, go for it. Done. Thank you all very much for your time. <coughs>